everyone, and welcome to the fifth episode, I can count it with one hand, of Banana Data Podcast. And I am so excited. You know why, CPM? Why? Because this is the first collab podcast, the first pro- crossover podcast. It's our that first date. done. It's our first date. Ah! And, we, and guess what? We are so proud to be joined by Jeremy Harris from Towards Data Science. And we're going to introduce Jeremy in a moment. But this is really exciting as this is a crossover podcast between Towards Data Science and the Banana Data Podcast. So CPM, before we get into everything and talk about everything going on today, what happened last week? Well, you know, last week we also had a first date, but it was the first internal date. Um, so Jeremy, I'm sorry we're cheating on you a little bit, but uh, we, we had a <laughs> really okay. great conversation. We had a really great conversation with um, Emma, a solutions engineer here at Data IQ, talking about the different defensive versus offensive strategies within the data science field. What are the benefits, detractions, implications? Um, if you're interested, do definitely take a check out of that episode. But today we are joined by Jeremy. Jeremy, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Welcome. Well- yeah, thank you. Thanks, CPM. Thanks, Corey. This is great. I'm really excited, by the way, to be part of your, uh, to be the third panel in your like three panel setup. Here. <laughs> um, I guess, uh, boy, what can I say? I mean, uh, so I host the Towards Data Science podcast. That's one thing, obviously. Um, we, uh, on the podcast, I should just mention, we talk a lot about uh, data science in general, but also in our latest season, we've been talking a lot about AI safety and mm-hmm. the things that a lot of people don't necessarily always think about when they think about AI. Usually we think about more capabilities, you know, being able to do more stuff with our data science, with our algorithms. But uh, increasingly, as our algorithms get more powerful, the question starts to become, you know, when should we be using AI to begin with? What are the ethical use cases? And then B, what are some of the ways we can make sure that as these things are being deployed in more and more high stakes scenarios, that we're not screwing something up? So I think a lot of that is going to become increasingly important in the next few years. That's sort of been the theme. Um, I also am the co-founder of a company called Sharpest Minds. So we are a basically a mentorship program uh, for aspiring data scientists, uh, analysts, machine learning engineers, and we work through income shares. The idea is that you work for free up front with a mentor, and then you repay after you get hired. Um, yeah, I mean, besides that, I do a fair bit of like AI policy type stuff um, with uh, different like organizations, some sort of AI for good type work. Uh, maybe I'll park the thought there. I'm really excited to be with you folks. This is going to be really cool. Thank you, Jeremy. So, so far this season, we have focused on the humanization of AI and what it means to have humans interacting with AI or the human role, uh, whether when it comes to data science or data science adjacent practices. Today, we're going to be focusing on, as Jeremy alluded to, the ethics and challenges and potential issues with that, sort of where the human in the loop sort of doesn't necessarily meet the standard and what the consequences of that is. And you know, we're, we might sound a little futuristic. We might be talking about things today that you kind of think, well, well, that's not happening anytime soon. But you'd be surprised how much these things are coming into the, the limelight now and how uh, international events are impacting these types of conversations and how, you know, we're trying to get ahead of these issues and try to discuss it. So as, uh, as the crossover alludes to, we're going to go towards data science today. Ooh. Oh, yes. Oh, what a segue. Well, that feels good. <laughs> Awesome. So I yeah, so I think we're going to start with a with a piece that we read. It's actually without a shameless plug here. It's from Egg on Air, which is a, a really cool initiative launched by Data IQ, um, and it's a lot of really free, wonderful, and free content that if you guys want to check out. So we recently had a piece published from Egg on Air in which it spoke about um, firsthand strategies from the CDO of Morgan Stanley. And it was about becoming an intelligent organization in the age of AI. And we're talking about accountability and about how accountability can be maintained with the right ops and structure. You know, when it comes to data stewards, who's accountable for data accuracy? If you're using machine learning to pattern client behavior and that for some reason doesn't work or it it has an unintended consequence, then who's accountable for it? Is it the machine learning algorithm? Is it the human in the loop? How should we judge something like this at, at, for example, the enterprise level? Yeah, and I think that's a, oh, sorry. No, please go ahead. (laughs) Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, I mean, like I I think this is one of the classic problems that we're gonna be dealing with more and more as as these sorts of things start to pop up. You know, uh, Corey, you alluded to human in the loop. I think one question is like, what is the space 
that that human is going to occupy? What kinds of decisions are they going to be onboarding as the technology improves and we move towards more and more automated systems? Like, I think there's this, we're in this weird transient right now where AI can't do everything. It can do a lot of things. And that border is constantly shifting. So whatever set of principles we come up with that says like, okay, this is how we hold somebody responsible. It's going to have to be dynamic. There's no way that there's like a one size fits all thing that's going to work here because, you know, next year or in a few months from now, OpenAI is going to come out with GPT-4. A whole new set of things are going to be automatable that weren't yesterday. And, uh, and then everything has to be kind of re rethought. So I think there's a sense in which, you know, we need to move from thinking about like this, this kind of static model, which worked really well when we were talking about just the, the web 1.0 world of databases and front end UI and that sort of thing to like, yeah, now everything's got to become a process, right? I mean, you, you can't count on static solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And especially in a space like AI, where honestly, it could be used for both good or evil. It's the same tool, but it's how you're going to end up using it that determines whether or not it's, you know, being used for good or for evil. And in these types of situations, it's very hard to kind of allow for um, appropriate usage um, and, and, and regulate that in a sense. Like if we're thinking about um, what happens when AI goes wrong, what happens when there's a mistake or a failure, um, what's the result of that? Um, how do we protect ourselves from you know, those occurrences? They're gonna happen. <laughs> Realistically speaking, they're gonna happen. Um, and how do we find that balance? Um, in some ways, you know, we can have things like, you know, um, the GDPR, where we're talking about um, uh, protecting uh, our, our sensitive data or making sure that companies have a purpose for the reason why they collect this um, and uh, this type of information or um, pr a purpose for why they want to use that type of information. Um, we can have legal considerations around what we're going to do. Um, but what happens when something goes wrong? Are we going to rest on that to exonerate ourselves from blame? Um, or are we actually going to consider like the moral implications of what happens when something goes wrong? Very yeah, big questions mean, that don't necessarily have answers. Yeah, and I'm sorry, CPM. I guess in this no. uh, aspect here, I'm the evil one because I was the one who interrupted you. <laughs> um, but uh, even if we're looking at it just like from a really simple nature, like we were talking last week about specialists versus generalists. The week before, we were mm -hmm. talking about the rise of the citizen data scientists. And I mean, no disrespect to any, you know, no connotation, no assumptions with those types of names or those types of, of, of roles. But like at what point, as automation becomes more advanced, what, at what point does data science or the solution engineering, which are two examples that we cited last week, become like data maintenance, where you're just sort of maintaining things and you're just observing things. And the article that we're citing here says like, ultimately a human being still needs to make a decision, but like if things are becoming more advanced and more automated, how big of a decision or how much, in the loop do they need to be? I mean, if they're just trained to, and this is a totally off-base example here, but just for the purpose of, of you know simplifying things, if you're just trained to push a button, or if you're just trained to record data, if you're just trained to do things without sort of understanding the practice, the ethics, the consequences of it, who's ultimately responsible? Is the corporation, is the enterprise liable? Is the organization liable? Is the individual liable? Are we gonna start talking about needing to regulate uh, algorithms, just like we're, we're regulating you know, data privacy with GDPR, uh, it starts becoming really complicated because I think those two are kind of running against each other. Yeah, I think, I think there's also a sense in which, you know, in the limit as technology gets really powerful, AI technology and its capabilities increase, everything becomes an alignment problem. Like your, your whole problem in using these systems is figuring out like where to point them and what problems to ask them to solve. There's like, a, so one, one really common failure mode of not just AI systems, but human systems in general uh, comes from this, this principle called Goodhart's law. Have, have you guys, should I explain this or is, is this something you talked about on the podcast? Go, go ahead and explain it. Okay, cool. So uh, Goodhart's law basically is this idea that the moment you, you settle on a metric that you want to optimize, that metric ceases to be a good metric of the thing you're trying to optimize for. So for example, like we can go through a million examples of these, but I think the stock market today is pr a pretty good example. If mm -hmm. you look back at the year 1920, if the stock market went up, more or less the American economy was doing better. You could make that assumption or that inference. Today, 
The stock market can go up for a million different reasons, many of which have nothing to do with the underlying thing that it was nominally supposed to measure or that it, it's often used to measure. Um, you know, you, you could have money printing, you could have uh, all kinds of corporate funny business going on, hedge funds doing all kinds of crazy things, GameStop, you name it. So the idea is like, as you define a metric, essentially human structures, or let's say more broadly intelligent structures, begin to form to kind of optimize the crap out of that metric because all of a sudden they're being rewarded for it. So you find all these creative, kind of dangerously creative in some way, some ways, um, ways of, of making this happen. And so when you look at a, a corporate structure and you start to say something like, um, let's look at, at Twitter, for example, you know, you're sitting at Twitter and you're saying, all right, well, we want to maximize for uh, user engagement for clicks on ads. All of a sudden you realize, well, what kind of content is engaging? And you've sort of, you're starting to optimize for a number, but at the expense of potentially even the user experience in the long run. So like there's an implicit time horizon when you choose a metric as well. So over time, our ability to define the metrics we want to optimize for becomes the limiting step. It becomes the thing that prevents us from making progress, whether it's in a corporate setting, whether it's in a sort of dangerous uses of AI setting like defense and drones or whatever it is, it all kind of boils down to the same thing. You need a metric. That metric needs to not be dangerous in the limit as you focus myopically on it and basically rig it. And that mm -hmm. Goodhart's law is a problem that like we really have not solved after, you know, 10, 10 millennia or whatever working at it, I guess. It's like the definition of irony here, right? You have a good heart in the sense that you want to do something, um, but then that is actually in turn causing the downfall in the long run. I remember actually long time ago working for like social media advertising, and we ended up finding that posts that had cute animals on it was, you know, those were driving a lot of clicks and, 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 and you know, exposure for the brand. Uh, the brand was all about cleaning up lots of messes, but people stopped focusing on that um, uh, and more on the cute animals that were getting in themselves into weird situations, getting dirty. Um, obviously that is a, you know, a type of situation where the stakes are fairly low. Um, you know, we're not changing the world necessarily by selling a cleaning product. Um, but uh, definitely as we optimize towards clicks and comments and shares, um, we kind of lost sight of, you know, our job as social media advertisers yeah. and selling a product. I just want to go back to a point before CPM. Uh, I just want to, to note that, you know, I feel like what I am doing on this podcast is impacting the hearts and minds of the world. So speak for <laughs> yourself. No, I'm just kidding. But, Did um, good versus evil just we yeah. switch spots again? <laughs> we're, just talking, we're just talking about automation and we're talking about like, you know, relatively small stake stuff. I mean, like these things are important. AI at the enterprise level could be accomplishing very important things, has very large budgets, makes very large impact. But in the grand scheme of things, it's kind of a little bit smaller in scope. Jeremy, do you kind of want to talk about, you know, AI safety challenges and ethics um, and how it could sort of impact things on a much larger and more significant scope? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to. I think, um, so I'll, I'll talk about AI safety first, maybe the, the ethics thing is, yeah, I think it's own interesting conversation. Um, so the AI safety piece really is just an extension of what we've just been talking about. Just like you said, Corey, I mean, you know, you can pretend that you're in this little sandbox, it's just corporate AI, no big impact. But when we really talk about extrapolating to, you know, not far off really from where we are today, if, if you simply draw straight lines on graphs, uh, you know, we get into a world where AI can do an awful lot of things. And this alignment problem that we were talking about earlier starts to apply to like not just corporate reporting or computer vision for like Twitter or, or whatever else, but to like, you know, weaponized drones, um, even to AI research itself. So the, the furthest extent, the furthest limit of this concern has to do with what happens when you get an AI system that's been tasked with pretty much anything. It doesn't really matter what the task is. The point is it has some, some number it's trying to optimize for. And it, it essentially carries out or goes through this process of what's called in, in the AI safety community, instrumental convergence. So this idea of instrumental convergence is that regardless of what task a, a really intelligent system is, is designed to do, it's going to realize, hey, you know, in order to do that thing, I actually have to kind of do a couple things first. Like I've got to, I've got to set the foundation a little bit. And there are a couple of things that will always go into the foundation, almost no matter what the task is that you specify. One of these things is, for example, control. This is very hard to imagine if you had a super, super, super intelligent AI system. It's very hard to imagine it wanting less control over its environment. 
right? In particular, it would want to prevent people from shutting it down. So if you have a, an AI that's designed to the classic example, it's like to make paper clips. You have a paperclip maximizer, it's super intelligent paperclip maximizer. Who knows why you'd want to make this, but whatever. So, Clippy will be uh, upset from Microsoft Word. That's so. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's, I'm personally concerned that's where it's going to come from. But <laughs> so you've got this this paperclip maximizer, and it kind of goes, okay. Well, the one thing I know is I'm not going to be able to make any paperclips if somebody turns me off. That's guaranteed. So let's absolutely make sure that like that doesn't happen. So how do I get there? Well, I've got to control my environment very closely. Second thing is I can't make any paper clips unless I have like iron or whatever goes into paper clips. I don't have a PhD in paper clips, but you can imagine there's like some resource that you need. And then it starts to notice like, oh, wow, there's some of that in like the Earth's crust in the moon. Like eventually the whole universe gets turned into a giant paperclip factory. And this sounds absolutely like banal. It sounds like like the most ridiculous, like like contrived setup. But unfortunately, it really seems that AI systems do have this tendency towards instrumental convergence and that greater control over their environment is something you could reasonably extrapolate from past behavior and theory that they might want. And so now the question is like, you know, you might be looking at turning an AI on to perform a given task without actually knowing what that might lead to through because of instrumental convergence and other things. So the unpredictability of these systems is unfortunately a very deep feature and people in the AI safety and AI alignment community have been struggling with this really hard and frankly don't really have any any answers there are a lot of promising avenues that they're they're going down but they need time and resources to, to make it happen and that's sort of a dominant concern in the far future let's say yeah and I feel like this is very similar to the discussion about power and transparency when it comes to AI and, and regulation of AI in general um, you know, I think it, it, in it, broadly speaking, when any individual or I guess any AI system has more power uh, mm -hmm. and influence, um, it should then also complement with more transparency on how I'm making this decision. You know, whether it's a CEO of a company who controls the company, um, you know, if employees are going to be, you know, feeling like they're part of a greater good or feeling like they're contributing to something that they really believe in. They want to know that their CEO's decisions, why they've been made, how it impacts them, um, that influence affects all of the employees, but having more transparency into the decision-making process feels more comforting. On the flip side, if somebody has less power, less influence, then there's a lesser need of transparency and they can have more privacy with their sort of data or choices um, in the day-to-day. -day. AI sort of breaks that paradigm in the sense that as it gets more complex, um, we often lose out on transparency. And mm -hmm. so if you're going to have this, I guess, paperclip making <laughs> uh, you know, system um, and it's you know, going to increasingly become more sophisticated, um, uh, if we lose sight of exactly how that's going to happen, um, but we have I I indications that it will happen, um, that can feel very disconcerting. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, and, you know, that's a, you know, I guess a contrived example in a sense, but, you know, we can think about more impactful examples, um, whether it's, uh, you know, drones uh, in a field um, or, uh, you know, whether we're going to buy something on Amazon from a recommendation. <laughs> yeah. CPM. I think that... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. George. Sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say I was getting excited about that, but it, this is actually, I think, a really deep and fundamental point. Um, th the difference between safety and transparency, safety and, and what's called interpretability or clarity in the, um, so OpenAI actually has a clarity team. The difference between these two things is actually like gets really muddied really fast. You're right. Like if I can't tell what a system's doing, my ability to ensure that it's reliable and safe is like really, really limited. So these two things are, I think, intimately linked. It's like, you can't have safety without clarity. And to some degree, uh, the reverse is also true, though it gets a bit more complicated. So like mm -hmm. OpenAI has a safety team and they have a clarity team. And the clarity team spends all their time figuring out like, how can I show how this neural network is thinking for precisely the reason you articulated? It's sort of like with great power comes great responsibility. Like exactly. you said, yeah, whether it's a corporation, right? The, the You can literally think of the, the brain of the CEO of a company as an extension of whatever neural networks that company is deploying in the limit. So like th this is a distributed intelligence. Some part of it is running on, on neurons. Some part of it is running on silicon. But there, there's, a, there's a connection between the two. And yeah, you need to be able to audit both ends of the spectrum. Jeremy, you brought up a really good point before. And I know uh, both you and CPM have sort of referenced this twice now. I want to talk about drones. 
because there was an example that happened recently that I think kind of really sort of fits really neatly or maybe not so neatly into, into what we're discussing. Um, we, we talk about, it, you know, I, I think uh, you mentioned something before that I wanted to kind of bring up the irony about, which is the unpredictability and the fact that like when you're trying to automate something, it could lead to something that's unpredictable, which I think is, is pretty ironic on its face because the purpose of automating something is to ensure that it's going to complete a process, but there might be unintended consequences here, as you mentioned before with the paperclip example. But there was recently an example in Libya in which there was a drone that was automated. It was not, there was no human in the loop that was operating it at that time. And, um, and, and I uh, implore our listeners to research this themselves because I don't want them to assume that we are uh, coming to any sort of clear conclusion here because I think it's, a, it's, it's pretty complicated. It's not as cut, uh, as cut uh, and paste as, as you think, but more or less the, the drone um, attacked areas in Libya automated, it, 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 not prompted by a human. So, you know, we're talking about unintended consequences now. Is the drone a non-state actor? Who's responsible for it? Is the drone, is that action because it was automated by an algorithm, by a nation state, is that, are they liable for that? Is that the official policy of that government to be intending to do that because uh, because the, the drone was acting as it was taught to act. It, it really opens this whole gray area here that no one is considering. You know, I, I don't want to jump to any conclusions and say, because we've mentioned this in prior episodes, that this is, you know, the, you know, the plot of Terminator and Skynet is coming online. But I definitely do think that is concerning um, and something that I think hopefully a lot of countries that are operating drones either in warfare or for reconnaissance purposes or for research purposes, realize that, um, you know, that there's a learning opportunity there to kind of learn like what went wrong and what didn't. So Jeremy, uh, you don't have to speak to that situation specifically, but just kind of in the scheme of what we've been talking about, I think it's a really interesting example. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And I again, I don't think these things are at all disconnected. I think like there's this, we have this illusion that just because AI is being applied in a different area, that this is a somehow a new set of problems. But fundamentally, they come from our ability to have accountability, to have transparency, and to have reliability in these systems. Um, in the particular case you cited, I mean, so on, on my podcast, I had um, a, uh, I think he's a Canada research chair now in uh, reinforcement learning in Oh, if I try to get the exact area right, I'm going to screw this up. But anyway, <laughs> um, so th this is, um, uh, and now his name escapes, uh, Jacob Forrester. That was it, Jacob Forrester. So he's he's really a fascinating guy because he's focused on the technical side of things, but he has this real interest in drones and specifically in armed drones. And he was making the case that one of the fallacies we have when we look at, um, at drone usage and, and, and weaponized drones in particular is that we create this axis of decision making. And we say like, okay, you're allowed to have a weaponized drone, but only if it, it does this much and there's a human in the loop that's like doing the rest of the thinking. And then we put this like little box with a human inside and we're like, hey, that box has to be there. Uh, otherwise you're breaking some, some sort of rule. And he was arguing like as a technical person that this is a, a just a losing proposition that you're you're going to have a shifting of the goalposts. You're going to have AI kind of encroaching in ways that aren't obvious or predictable on that box, and that eventually, even if it's almost a Goodhart's law thing, if you optimize for something that looks like a black box, it will not eventually be a black box. Eventually, the AI will effectively transcend all of this. We'll find hacks to effectively make it fully automated um, as we try to kind of fool each other into thinking, oh no, we have a responsible system. And so his claim was, look, we need to think about instead of uh, limiting the degree of automation, because that's sort of a, a fruitless kind of uh, continuum that we'll never be able to, to find a nice cutoff for, um, we need to restrict weaponization. So there can't be drones with weapons on them. I think it, like, it's an interesting proposition. I don't think this is a tractable one, unfortunately, when it comes to you know, what, uh, what, the, what China, what the US, what, what other countries are doing with, with their you know, drone weapons. Every country has an incentive to compete here. And it's a race to the bottom ultimately on safety. So somehow the answer, I think, and this is like a hot take here, but I really think the answer has to come down to coordination in some way. How we do that, that's a different problem. 
I like I I don't know. I, I would be lying if I pretended to have a clear idea. Maybe AI can help, and and that's actually something that some people at OpenAI certainly seem to to believe uh, based on my conversations with them. But uh, one way or another, it's a coordination problem, and we've got to figure out how to build trust at least somehow in this context. I I don't know how though. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't claim that I know much about global politics or global policies uh, and, uh, you know, studied statistics and data science, not history. Um, so I definitely don't have a solution here, but I love this, this concept of alignment globally, um, especially as it has to do with AI um, and responsible AI, um, because, you know, we throw around terms all the time about responsibility and ethics and all that, those types of things. Um, but those are very subjective, depending upon who you are and where you come from. Um, ethics can be very different. Values can be very different. And they're all, um, those are like value-based terms. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, at, at, at a certain point, you know, if we all are going to agree upon some sort of set ground rules, whether it's for drone operation or, you know, anything else in the space, um, it can't necessarily be along those lines because there's there's so much subjectivity there. And that's something yeah. that we're going to have to overcome at some point. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think the um, the idea of getting humans to align on a, share, a set of shared values is like, I mean, literally as old as human civilization. And it's like, <laughs> it's one of these thorny things, right? Where, yeah, like, let's say we could have a safe AI according to one set of values. You're absolutely right. I mean, this is not an AI that... You know, the AI that comes out of Silicon Valley isn't going to, it won't even be a good AI from the standpoint of somebody who lives in the Midwest. It won't even be a good AI from the standpoint of somebody who lives in Boston. Like the, like different areas, even different people have different views on what, what good is. And as you get closer and closer to like de defining exactly what you're going to implement, as you move from, um, you know, Corey was talking about Google moving from this like do no evil or, or yeah, the, yeah, don't be evil to do the right thing. Like that's sort of, that's its own challenge. You're moving from saying like, we're not going to do this to, oh, we found the one good thing to do, which is a very strong ethical statement. And it brings with it this baggage, which is like, okay, who, who gets to decide? And I think so many of these AI problems are really people problems that are just now in a, in a new kind of, uh, new kind of costume. Yeah, I mean, I think if we look back to the first piece that we're talking about, about becoming an intelligent organization, obviously, you know, correlation is an equal causation, and it's kind of hard to kind of compare these two practices here. But when I was reading a part of it and then kind of just thinking through the frame of how we were just, you know, talking about AI and global policy and, and especially, you know, the drone example that we talked about, you know, you can still, you can create models to utilize tools, platforms, et cetera. But at the end of the day, you still need to think is my data good and predictive? Yeah. And do I believe in what I'm predicting? But if you have this drone that's fully automated and it's you're doing exactly what you taught it to do or, or coded it to do or whatever, who's really thinking, who really believes in, in that? And it just, I think that becomes, I, maybe right now, especially at the enterprise level, you know, places that aren't as advanced in their maturity scale for AI, they're still at that level where they can safely and 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 uh, claim that. But as we start getting more, you know, as, as things start getting more advanced and as the scale starts sliding up even more, and you, you know, we head to these races to the bottom. At, at which point, how, when does that really just become like a fallacy? Like, when do you really need to still think, and when do you really believe in what you're predicting? Well, there's yeah. almost a sense like you we can think about the movie Wally, -E, right? Where uh, you know there is this clip of like an, a dystopian future almost is what, the way it's presented. But in the sense, some people could argue that you know if if a computer is is uh, helping you move around, you know these little chairs that are you know floating you around, or helping you make your own decisions, or the food is just a Slurpee now and it's so much easier to ingest. Everything is always available to you. Um, some people might argue, well, that's making everything more convenient. That's making everything so much better. Everything, life is, is so much more improved. But at the end of the day, you know, you have the counter argument that people are uh, losing their own skills. You know, if we think about um, like autopilot on planes, you know, that's really mm -hmm. fantastic, you know, uh, set of, of tools that pilots have at their disposal. But, you know, maybe if they use autopilot too much, then they'll forget how to fly a plane. Um, so there's benefits and detractions to AI becoming more sophisticated. Um, and, uh, you know, 
the line is sort of blurred as to where benefits and detractions fall. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I'm... So sorry, go, go ahead, Corey. Right. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. I think we're going to have to go back and edit out kind of the parts that we're speaking over each yeah, other, no. unfortunately. But, uh, <laughs> such a lively bunch. <laughs> such a lively bunch. But um, anyway, uh, a few years ago, I remember that there was so much hype with ride sharing companies like the Ubers and the Lyfts, like who's gonna, and then like, you know, had other companies like Google and I think Amazon as well, where it's like, who's gonna be the first company that's gonna be able to turn their fleet into fully automated vehicles. And then for a number of reasons, but I think ultimately there was just a decision with the human in the loop where they just felt that they weren't comfortable yet to be able to expose that technology and that the consumer wouldn't be comfortable doing that based off of the data that was, uh, developed based off of the pilots, you don't hear that conversation anymore. I don't read articles about yeah. Uber and Lyft and Google. And like, uh, I, I believe Lyft just sold off its automated car, um, AI car division, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Like, it's just kind of interesting where you kind of see like, oh, well, automation is clearly the future. Um, and, you know, obviously the next leap is going to be these automated car fleets where you're, everything is just going to be controlled on the app and the car is going to come pick you up. It's going to take you to its destination. It's going to know exactly what to do. It's going to be trained to be able to stop at red lights. It's going to be able to yield to, to passengers and stuff like that. But, you know, that, did, that didn't work out. And I just kind of find it funny about how, you know, we're so sure about all these other advances and it's like obvious like five years ago it was obvious that by this time we would there would be so much progress on that front but like it's not even a reality now i think that yeah it speaks to a very deep challenge with predicting what technologies are going to be able to do easily and what they're not going to be able to do easily so there's this thing called moravec's paradox which is like named after hans moravec the like computer scientist um and it's just this this idea that like what's easy for humans is very often not easy for machines and vice versa. So for example, mm -hmm. like articulating my hands around, I'm like, this is an easy task. Like, ha ha, yeah, I can't even do this. We're like, it's so stupid. And then you turn around and you're like, yeah, but like, can you identify like 10,000 melanomas in like 60 seconds based on like, you know, better than a radiologist? Like, no, you can't, but AI is doing that. So it's it's this weird thing where it becomes really difficult to to forecast the capabilities of these systems because like Corey, as you said, like this it's all very tempting when you look at melanomas to be like, oh yeah, like come on, self driving cars. That's just that's just this. That's just this. That's like that's that's a couple things that I can do pretty easily, and it also ties into like how we evaluate these systems too. You know, you look at at a, a self driving car, and one of the most common uh, points of objection that people will raise is they'll show examples of failures of self-driving cars. They'll say, look at the self-driving car that just plowed over the cyclist. And they'll say, oh, what a stupid system. But uh, but, but it's in the aggregate, these systems are actually far safer in many cases, in, in many cases, not all, um, than human beings. And so what's actually going on is like there, there are mistakes that we make that would be far stupider than just like through a different lens than those that the AI makes. And so it becomes hard to say, like, when do you hand it off? We're going to live in a world, presumably, where every once in a while, like some some poor little girl gets run over by a car in a way that seems completely stupid and and insensitive, nonsensical, and yet we don't see all those cases where an accident that definitely would have happened with a human driver gets averted. So it's very difficult mm -hmm. and counterintuitive to kind of manage these things, and I, I don't know how the evaluation can or should proceed. But I think you're you're hitting on a really important point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is to me. This harkens back to like crisis management. In in an organization, uh, the best crisis management is when it's averted before it is a problem. But the things that are sensationalized are the big time that something goes wrong. So I mean, it's the exact same point that that you just made, Jeremy. Like you know, those are the types of things that are focused on, even though in the long run or in aggregate, there's a a, a much reduced rate of them, or even in in aggregate, those occurrences are less impactful. Yeah. And the fact in, in many cases, the fact that these systems are automated too makes it tempting to kind of like to, to trust them even more, like in a weird way, systems that we shouldn't be trusting for, for some applications will kind of go like, oh, but you know, I plug the number in the thing or I plug the query in the thing. Surely this is the right answer because it's not a fallible human. So I think like we make, yeah, we make mistakes in a lot of different directions here. And the kind of fallibility of humans starts to interact with the fallibility of these machines. And then sometimes the errors you get are like, very difficult to predict because they they come from these complex interactions yeah mm -hmm.
Well, this has been a lively conversation. Frankly, I'm a little terrified. Uh, so it, it, the future of AI is bright, but, but it's also dark at the same time. So it's a nice yin and yang. Uh, so Jeremy, it's really been a pleasure working with you and working with Towards Data Science on this crossover episode, this collaboration I thought was wonderful. And I, and I really appreciate you uh, joining us and making this a reality. I super appreciate the, the invitation. This was a ton of fun. I, I will add on that last note, you know, there are, and this is something that I've I've seen on, on the Towards Data Science podcast, there are a lot of really impressive people working on these problems. It's very easy to, um, you know, like Richard Feynman, the famous physicist, had this anecdote where he's walking around New York City in the, I don't know what it was, the 70s or something, and he's looking around and he's telling himself the story. Oh man, it's so sad that all of this is going to be gone in, I don't know what it is, five, 10 years, because nuclear war is inevitably going to destroy the <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. So like we, we forget all too easily that we've been through phases like this. Uh, very important, uh, very, uh, sorry, very clever, very creative people are working on these problems. Um, it's been a big focus on the Towards Data Science podcast. I think it's important to keep the positives in mind as well. This technology can shape a really bright future and um, we just have to steward it in the right direction. And I think podcasts like this one, uh, conversations like this one, if they can encourage people to kind of dive into the space and see where they can contribute at the margins, I think that's an awesome thing. And I, I really thank you both for a really lively and entertaining conversation. Well, the pleasure has been all ours. Um, I've certainly enjoyed uh, our first date, Jeremy. Um, and for our loyal listeners, of course, you know that um, we'll be back in just about two weeks with another episode. Um, make sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, whether that's on Apple or Spotify or anywhere else. Um, Jeremy, where can we find you and, and the Towards Data Science podcast? Yeah, well, if you're listening to this as part of the Towards Data Science podcast, I guess then, you know, hi. Uh, <laughs> nice to see you again. And I hope you you enjoy the Banana, the banana, data, the, the banana data Podcast. I was going to say the Banana Data Science Podcast. I've got too much going on. Um, yeah, I think this is awesome. And I think people definitely should check out more of your conversations. You're, you're having so many inter interesting ones. Um, yeah, you can find the Towards Data Science Podcast on uh, Anchor, um, Spotify, Spotify. Uh, a Google podcast. I mean, it's, it, we're on all the platforms. So just look up, uh, you know, towards data science podcast, hopefully you'll find us. And yeah, I think, I think that's it for me. I had a ton of fun. Thanks you. Thank you both again for inviting me. This is great. Thank you, Jeremy. And we'll see you next time. Sweet.